Hello, my name is Michaela O'Connor Abrams, founder of Mocha Plus. Welcome to our Collective Conscience series. We created this series for you to bring together great minds from around the world on myriad topics that we hope will expand your mind, will challenge your current beliefs, and give you an opportunity to be inspired with every video. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Collective Conscience. It is wonderful to have you all back again. Uh, we had 40 Collective Conscience salons on Monday nights, 40 consecutive Monday nights in 2020. Because after all, what else were we doing? <laughs> but staying uh, indoors and figuring out how to commune with each other over some interesting topics. And that is how all of these 40 weeks were born. Really trying to make sure that we spurred a discussion on myriad topics from farming to production of all of our food to gleaners to wineries to futurists um, and authors and many people in between and it was an incredible 40 weeks you will find it all on the mocha plus youtube channel and so you'll see a little teaser there of an overview if you've not had a chance to be a part of one of our salons or to have visited that, please do. And you'll see that overview. And then you will see all of them there and you may choose any or all and binge watch them as we want to do sometimes on Netflix and our favorite um, TV serials. So today, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our guest speaker, Randy Carlson. I hope you all agree that what better time as we celebrate coming out of COVID, some people think ever so slowly, some people think cautiously and prudently, but regardless, it's a perfect time to talk about spirits, to celebrate the fact that we, um, have taken the opportunity to toast each other, some people say to get toasted, and in general, uh, enjoy the spirits that now are in, in great abundance, perhaps more than ever before, or more than in the last 100 years, and Randy and I will talk about this. So a little bit about the format, I muted everybody on uh, acceptance, we are missing about 10 of the people who uh, are SVP. So as people join, they, they too will be muted. Uh, for those of you who've been with us before, we welcome you to add your questions and comments into chat. We'll be monitoring chat. If you prefer to save your question and raise your hand and ask it directly to Randy or to me, we welcome that also. But this is to be, <clears throat> excuse me, an engaging discussion one that we can take wherever you would like to take it after we set the stage for an overall discussion of the spirits industry and then Vermont spirits, a craft distillery specifically and their role and what it's like to have a cocktail with a Vermont spirits spirit. And so without further ado, Randy, welcome. Thank you, Michaela. I, I'm uh, grateful to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, greetings, everyone. Hope you're having a great Monday. Um, this really is an honor for me. It, it's uh, it's been a while since I've been on any kind of a panel discussion, so I'll just kind of give you that preface. With uh, I may stumble over a word here and there, but uh, I'll do my best to be a, a value-added contributor to your to your forum. Wonderful. Well, I love your background. I'm sure we all appreciate it. Looks like that's really a nod to the Barnwood from the. <laughs> A distillery in uh, St. Johnsbury, uh, Vermont, close to the Canadian border, which I, I would love to visit someday. But I uh, love your, your background with all the spirits uh, from Vermont spirits behind you. A little shameless plug, but yeah, that, that barn would actually was harvested from a barn that fell down in 1860, right across the hill from where our original distillery was, and across the street from where our distiller lives now. And uh, Harry and I went up and, and harvested this wood last uh, October, I guess it was, and uh, redid the inside of the distillery, which uh, if you have a chance to see it, I encourage you, anybody who's up in the Vermont area or Boston or New York, it's, uh, for me, it's absolutely worth an extra uh, little trip up there. It's a beautiful part of the world and it's not to be missed, but it's, uh, it's authentic. It's like everything we do at the distillery. This is, 
this is the real deal off a barn in Vermont. This isn't something we bought on, uh, you know, Etsy or, uh, you know, one of the online retailers that can provide you with this kind of stuff. Now, uh, this is this is the actual actual thing. From, from Wonderful. Our, yeah. Well, <clears throat> Randy, let's start just framing the industry, if we might. We are talking here, folks, about a thirty-two billion dollar industry at wholesale. Almost uh, double that is safe to to do um, for retail, which are the package stores and the on-premise consumption. So safe to say, a sixty-four billion dollar industry and growing. Now, of course, the pandemic affected everyone, and this industry was no exception. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about with Randy is what really happened there. And much like the discussions we had last year with farmers, with um, craft food makers and package goods in much smaller spaces and in uh, a supply chain that wasn't, of course, supported as handily as the large corporations. What happened to craft distillers and what is the grand hue and cry from consumers? So I wanna touch on that. Um, as we look at the number of brands that are emerging also from celebrities, Randy, we're gonna talk about what is that? Because a um, little bit of history, my late husband was a brand manager for Canadian Club back in the day and launched Two Fingers Tequila. And that's when having a celebrity meant making sure that you had a celebrity to help you promote it. But there's a very different role this, that celebrities are taking on now as founders, George Clooney, Ryan Reynolds, uh, Kendall Jenner. We, we have a, a very different dynamic. So I wanna touch on that. Um, for just a bit of background, this is not Randy's first rodeo. He launched Ciroc Vodka. He was the global brand director for Diageo on that brand. And that's just one of many things that um, he has done in the industry, as well as in other industries, knowing how to launch a brand, understanding all of the integrated marketing levers that one must consider and work with to have a successful launch. And of course, a very successful continued growth path. So all that said now, Randy, let's just talk about this industry and consumption being up considerably. I've, as you and I spoke earlier, there are a number of different sources and therefore as data always has it, very different numbers from modest growth in the teens and twenties to some people saying in the hundred plus percent. Tell us a little bit about where we are right now in that dynamic. Yeah, that's a. It's been a crazy, uh, a crazy year in in the industry in total. Uh, with some states, California included, uh, completely shutting down retail for uh, or the on premise rather for for a number of months. Um, my own state, Vermont, uh, we went to a, a COVID lockdown, uh, essentially shutting us down, shutting our business down, uh, but the meeting house uh, for, for a number of months as well. And tourism dropped off by half. So consumption, obviously, you'd expect to fall. Shockingly, uh, consumption at the Vermont liquor stores went up during that period, uh, which is, or at least the purchases did. And there's a different dynamic that goes on in California versus Vermont. And I, I can explain that in a minute. Uh, but the, uh, the consumer shift um, went from uh, drinking while you're out at dinner occasionally to drinking while you're at home. So the volume for the manufacturer went from being in the restaurants, bars, and nightclubs at about 15 to 20%, 18% is about right. Um, I, I'm sorry, um, uh, is 30 percent of supplier volume went in there. Uh, it dropped down to about 12 to 18 percent, depending on the states and the market. It went to zero for a period of time for the whole year. So that's a huge, huge sh fundamental shift in the business. And when companies are built to um, help support the restaurants and bars and really create experiences for consumers around their brands in those venues, and they don't have that channel anymore, well, you're going to make your plan somehow. So you retrench. You're a big company. You retrench. You refocus on the off trade or the at home consumption. And you didn't really need to do a whole lot of marketing investment at a very uncertain time because the consumer is already picking it up. And strange things happen. Uh, I'm sure you've all experienced this a little bit. Your drinks at home tend to be a little bit taller, right? Your uh, mixology tends to be, yep, cheers, Drew. I see that. And it's, <laughs> here's, now this, this is not vodka, but that's my, that's my normal, right? So, um, <laughs> It's uh, but the whole dynamic changed, and so people were were much more comfortable being 
uh, their own uh, cocktail curator at home after a short period of time of being stuck at home and not really having anywhere to go. So all of the purchase consumption just shifted and the industry actually grew last year as a whole. Now, Michaela, you touched on uh, what happened to the small guys in that equation. So craft distillers are a little over 2000 uh, at the beginning of COVID. Um, many of them survived thanks to things like the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, but there was a lot of shakeout in the industry as well. And it's because our businesses don't work the same. We're not making uh, big sales into big retail. We're not making big sales into chains, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, the hotel, restaurant, nightclub chains aren't opening their doors and saying, give me all the smallest players you can in the marketplace. They're looking for the big brands and the big investors to come in with their total package for the entire year. And we don't compete in that space. So we do, as craft distillers, we do a, a disproportional amount of our business in our own facilities. And uh, a few of the craft distillers break out of that. Um, a few of the small brands break out of that. A lot of them do it on the, on the partnerships that they create. Uh, a great example is uh, Hudson. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Hudson Baby Bourbon, uh, which came out of Tuttletown Spirits uh, several years ago. Tuttletown created, crafted, and, and sold very much locally um, and uh, had a partnership with a major manufacturer in which the manufacturer bought into the brand and then ended up buying the brand. And then in the end, ended up buying the entire distillery with all of its brands and launched into a national brand. So uh, that made this small homegrown brand part of a portfolio that then got the attention to get into, uh, you know, Bethmax in, in a big way and get into, um, you know, the Kimpton Hotel Group and, and be on their every single back bar at Kimpton. So most of the craft distillers don't have that opportunity. And so the suffering was when people weren't really leaving their houses or states were shutting down the tasting rooms, their businesses went in the tank. They, there just was no way to get revenue. So it was a very, very hard uh, first half of COVID. Um, what we had in Vermont, uh, fortunately for us, we were well positioned for a bit of a rebound. Our traffic came back, but not to the level that it did. We did some, uh, I think, very nimble repositioning within uh, Vermont and within our distillery and very much in our local community. Uh, and had uh, actually our, our 2020 numbers, despite being closed for five months, um, exceeded 2019 and exceeded our best year. So uh, we had a great 2020 in the end. Um, which is terrific, but it's not anywhere near what it could have been because we weren't able to really get our expansion into other markets in, in the Northeast and then in places like California, which we're available in now. So different people had different experiences, but on the whole, the craft industry got pummeled. The small guys really got beat up. So Vermont Spirits is a, a startup in a way because it's a new chapter. With you as the CEO, um, certainly, uh, paying great homage to the history, uh, which really began in 1999, right. right? So, you know, take us through a bit of that, if you wouldn't mind, so that we all have a context for what it's like to watch something like this grow, support all of the farmers around Vermont, really have this very um, almost altruistic mission and vision, even though choosing to be part of a national stage long-term, but it, that's a long trajectory, 1999 to today. So help us understand what that looked like. That, that is a long startup, isn't it? Yeah. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's past the F round. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, fortunately we're not, we're, we're still on B. We're knocking on the B yeah. door right now. So. <laughs> okay. That was a long time on A. Let me yeah, that's it. right. That's right. Well, you know, it starts out friends and family and then the serious investors over time, but I'll, I'll save that story for another conversation. But um, the, the origins were uh, actually an anthropologist who was living in Asia, um, Duncan Holiday. Uh, started Vermont Spirits, and he kind of did it out of an idea from around 1996 or so, where he'd been living out uh, literally in the forest in, in um, oh my gosh, I forgot what country he was in. Uh, I think it was in Thailand, actually. And he noticed how everybody was living off the land and, and living fairly well. And he thought, well, why can't I do that wherever I want to go? And, um, you know, rather than picking a, you know, an easy place, like, I don't know, where you get uh, 12 months of vegetable growth, he picked Vermont. Uh, which he had lived before. And, and our, as it turns out, our distiller built his original house when he lived there back in the 80s. And um, that's how they got to know each other. Um, but Duncan brought this idea back. And, and the thing that they do in Vermont uh, is make uh, maple syrup. And that comes out of the maple tree. And the maple tree is probably the most renewable uh, provider on the planet. It, all you need to do is 
go to the tree during certain days and put a little tap in it and it will produce all of the, uh, it's really maple water, about two to 4% sugars at that point um, that it'll pull out, right? So if this goes on for weeks at a time and you make that you know, delectable golden material that we all know and love, not the Aunt Jemima stuff, the real deal. And uh, Duncan's idea was to take that uh, and turn it into something that we, we all enjoy in a different context, which is vodka. And a uh, little truth about vodka, you, or all spirits really, you can distill spirits from any carbohydrate source. And Duncan uh, studied and uh, brought in some expertise, outside expertise. There wasn't a whole lot of how-to videos back then, right? 1998, 97. So he went out and did his own research as, as uh, you expect a scientist to do and uh, had hand created uh, glass column stills, do it in a different way than anybody else has ever done. A little bit of Yankee ingenuity, a little bit of science, a little bit of craft, a little bit of art, a lot of experimentation. And uh, he literally took the maple off of one side of the hill, uh, gravity fed and, and plumbed it around into the first step of the distillery and ran it through that with as much gravity as possible because there was no power up there. So you know, the only way to get thing is to either manually lift it or have the steam and the gravity do the feeding for you. So that's how it was built. And the original distillery, unfortunately, uh, burned to the ground. Uh, a cat knocked over a heating lamp and uh, took the thing down a couple of years later. So, uh, you know, dream up in flames. And he just went ahead and rebuilt and uh, built the same, you know, essentially the same setup. And uh, over time, uh, brought some other people in, friends and neighbors, and uh, started to get a little bit of a local reputation. And then by 2007, caught some national attention from Anheuser Bush at the time, uh, who was looking to expand into spirits and signed a distribution agreement. This was the A series. They built a big distillery and started building inventory. And then InBev bought AB and canceled all of their spirits plans and left the investors looking at each other saying, what are we gonna do now? And uh, fortunately had the opportunity to move it down to the middle of the state, higher traffic count and visitors were able to buy. And that kind of saved the company at that point. But it was still a roadside, kind of a very much local, local flavor. Our, uh, our, our maple doesn't come from the same hills. It comes now from Richardson's Farm, just in South Woodstock. Um, in fact, Reed was over there the other day, and we promised him the first bottles that come off of this distillation, which will be up on, uh, Harry just told me they'll be up on Monday, next Monday. So that's Harry's our distiller. It's very exciting. He got a great yield out of it this year too, which I attribute it to being good locally sourced stuff. And uh, everybody went, so. Uh, but that's that's kind of where the roots are, and those are authentic roots that you can't you can't just make that up. Diageo can't create from scratch that story. That story exists and it's real, and it's 22 years old now. Um, and, I, and not to critique Diageo, Diageo does believe in authenticity. And um, but you know, if somebody's looking for a quick fix in you know premium vodka, you, you can't really get a quick fix unless you've got the real story behind it. And you know, diamond filtering isn't enough. You have to have more. You have to have the real you know heart and soul and fingertips that go into the creation. That's what we have. So like so many brands and leading brands across many industries, the storytelling of the brand is what has captured the hearts and minds of consumers today. Um, and this has been true actually for more than a decade, but we have so many examples of brands um, that their story, how they began, who their founders are, really you know, not about the transaction, but everything about the soul of the right. brand, right? And that has been, at least to this point, a great differentiator for brands. And those who do it well, everybody seems to attempt it today, but those who do it really well have set themselves apart. Um, and my question to you is, going back to the whole part about the Hollywood factor here and the George Clooney's and the Ryan Reynolds and the Kendall Jenner's to name, just a few of a whole long list, you know, that's what used to help sell the spirit so that it had a persona, right? An identifiable brand of, of fame and fortune that somebody knew and, and the thought was the consumer desired to be like him or her. What do you think about the fact that these now, these faces of, of celebrity are not just being used as marketing tools, these people actually are doing this business themselves and wanting that to be part of their entire platform of authenticity, speaking of authenticity. So yeah, right. Well, the world the world's changed, hasn't it? So, I mean, back back when in, when your husband was doing it, even before that, Sean Connery in a Smirnoff ad was enough, right? And that was a seasonal in and out thing. And then next year was a different campaign. 
Um, that started to change uh, probably around the late 90s where um, celebrities started to be more closely associated, more guarded with their brand. So um, uh, th there was a, a little bit more of a, uh, call it a, a personal investment. You still had things like Jay-Z doing Anheuser-Busch ads and things like that, which is all fine. You know, that's endorsement and that's not going to go away. It's, it's going to happen. But you also had things like Michael Jordan all of a sudden uh, designing his own shoes, right? So when, when that started ratcheting up, I think everybody in this industry started looking around and saying, how, how do we make that happen here? in a way that's really authentic and truly authentic. And, you know, I'm, I was happy to be there at the genesis of the first, I think the first really truly authentic, um, you know, call it co-curator uh, when Sean Cohn Diddy got involved with Ciroc. I mean, Ciroc was already out there. It was in the marketplace. It was a, a you know, relatively established at high end you know, foodie establishments, um, but it was kind of stagnant. It, it got to about 40, 50,000 cases and didn't really grow anymore. And it was one of those things that Diageo said, we don't know what kind of home we have for this. And um, you know, getting uh, getting Diddy involved at a financial level, where the the success of the brand um, mattered to him, not just he's getting paid to do it, uh, and him activating himself, right, and all of the things that make up his brand and his persona and his network, um, that that really kind of flipped a, a new switch, I think, in the industry, where uh, you know the celebrity said, "Hey, I can leverage myself." in a way, as long as it's authentic. And other people tried to come in and do that on what they saw, they thought they saw. They thought they saw Sean Combs as the you know, pretty billboard. And so let's do that thing. And it's just, it's not credible. It doesn't work. And so in his world, he was the guy that was involved. It was his business and he was participating in it. And so it was credible all the way through his network. And so the next evolution of that is things like what, what Clooney did with his partners, which is uh, create a, a, a mythos around their uh, development of the thing. It's like, hey, we're all friends. We go down to Mexico. It's a great thing. We drink tequila. But none of this stuff is really our tequila. So let's make our own tequila and we'll bring it to you. And so that really um, was a great creation story. It's authentic, right? It feels real. It feels like you can, you can picture him. In fact, you don't even have to picture it because it was in their ads. Randy Gerber and George Clooney ride motorcycles through Mexico on the way to go pick up some Casamigos, right? And then it's on trucks and then it's everywhere. And then you know, a big manufacturer comes in and buys it for a billion dollars, which, you know, a business that didn't exist before that has this industry insider secret has tremendous margins. Um, this isn't consumer packaged goods. We're, you know, we're not selling Wonder Bread here or baby food. This is, this is high margin stuff. Uh, and it's very, very lucrative uh, when you're creating something that has that authenticity and is on brand for the individuals that are, uh, that are the faces of it. When things aren't on brand or when things don't look like they're, um, uh, they're real when they when they seem fake or feel fake. The consumers sniff right through that very quickly. It, it gets a veneer and it gets dismissed very quickly. Um, and you know, I hate to pick on on Jay because I, I think he's a he's a brilliant man. But uh, he's had a few things that he's come out with and said, "Hey, this is my mark, and I got this thing, and I'm buying Ace of Spades." And well, that was cool for a little while, and then it kind of ran its course. It's still out there, but it's not it's not Ciroc. It's not that that order of magnitude, and everybody loves it and believes it. Um, it's not Casamigos. It's not Ryan Reynolds, as you pointed out. Um, it's just, just last week, uh, uh, Aaron Paul and, um, uh, and, and his partner, which name escapes me again. Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, they just did a distribution, uh, arrangement and terms not disclosed, but I, I promise you it's a very lucrative agreement <laughs> that they put in place, uh, on the heels of something that they created together and they really did. Um, now, they didn't just go out and say, I'm going to figure out how to make a tequila. They hired people who knew exactly what they were doing to create some really great tequila that is going to pass the sniff test when somebody actually tastes it. So it's, it's becoming more and more part and parcel to complementary brand building with audiences that exist and can be uh, brought along. Yeah. So I think it's pretty exciting right now. So is this in the future for Vermont Spirits, influencer marketing, putting it, you know, as a, a very general term, but would you... Are you looking to do that? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, you, could, you could draw some dots on the line that says you bring in a CEO that has some history with this and, and maybe some great brands that have authenticity. <laughs> but I, I think the answer would be um, if it's authentic and it makes sense for our brands, and I'm not talking about Vermont Spirits brand, that's, that's one thing that stands in truth. But the brands like number 14 bourbon or our 15 hands bourbon, or you see over here on, on this side is our copper's barrel gin. Uh, if the individual has authentic connection to what Vermont stands for and all of our values, Vermont spirits in particular, 
and one of these brands or you know, potentially a new creation fits within that as well, then it's in, it's in play, sure. Um, if it's not, then, uh, then, then no, if it doesn't make sense and then, then we won't do it. It's Kettle One doesn't need a celebrity. Kettle One is Kettle One credential by its own. Tito doesn't need a celebrity except himself. And that's fine for, for Tito. That's not an overnight success, but <laughs> you know, a 21 year overnight success is a good one. Um, but it, it doesn't need to be done in the back of having uh, somebody who's on the big screen to do it. Yeah. So, you know, the, the latest that I was aware of only because my daughter called me as I was on uh, in Palm Springs on a project with the art museum and said, 818 is just out from Kendall Jenner. And I need, it's all out in Northern California. And there are three bottles in BevMo and Palm Springs. You've got to go buy them. And, you know, of course I, agree and get to BevMo that night. And um, I can't find the end cap that they say there is and everything. I go up to the guy who said, yeah, I had to pull it off because we just got flooded with people having to have this wow. tequila. Now, I, I contest here. This has nothing to do with the quality of that tequila or the fact they call it 818, which of course is her area code. You know, how long do these kinds of things last? So isn't this kind of a okay, ta-da, and it's candles, and then it either makes the grade or it doesn't, and it's a flash in the pan. What do you think? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good, um, it can be a good problem to have, right? <laughs> or it can be one of those things where you build expectations of, of infinite growth that just don't pan out. Um, do you remember Crystal Head Vodka? It's yes. Still, right, so um, there's a little bit of novelty, a little bit of Dan Aykroyd, and uh, a lot of bit of a struggle to keep growing um, because it's, you know, the vodka's good, um, it's expensive. The bottle's really cool and it's collectible, but there's only so many collectible bottles you can have and only so many, um, you know, $50 nights uh, with vodka that, that people are, are going to approach. So it's, it's finite and limited. And I don't think in that case, Dan Aykroyd's really thrown it over the top. In, in Kendall's, uh, well, I, you know, I, I hate to be, <laughs> I hate to be the prognosticator that says this is probably going to go about as long as Kendall stays relevant in the, in the you know, social media. But I think that's probably more likely because the credential, I don't know what the, I don't know what the tie is. I don't, I don't know the connective tissue between, I, I get on a piece of paper, how 818 fits in and how um, Kendall gets a, you know, a part of it to be the voice of it. And I get that tequila because it's the end thing now, but I'm not sure how those three things actually really mesh together in authenticity. So it, it, this this could be one that gets a little more staying power, or it could be one that you know is kind of a you know up and down and stays around, but doesn't really create a Casamigos time kind Got of. Story. Yeah. So let's move over to distribution channels and regulatory messy things that, without going you know into it too deeply, right? Um, <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, we can't just go online and order a case of something, or I'll have a mixed case of, and, you know, call somebody due to so many things, but the consumer is clearly in so many other industries taken charge, right? Yeah. But the spirits industry is way locked up in this kind of quagmire of distribution and depending on what state you live in, it's worse than others. So what, what do you think we're going to do? Where are we going from here? And how do we get it to relax? Because I believe the barriers will be broken down as they are in so many other places. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's, that's a really topical question, particularly for craft distilleries, because we have people all the time that stop in, they live out of state and they want to know how do they get the product. And um, it's, it really is a, a state by state uh, issue for distribution. This is kind of a, a hangover from prohibition. So when prohibition was repealed, the federal government said, okay, you can have alcohol and we'll regulate the licenses and collect taxes on the people who make it. But every state gets to decide who gets to make it, how they make it, where it gets sold, how it gets sold. And interstate commerce is, is, is not going to be regulated by, uh, well, it's, it's not going to be free, right? It's not going to be free reign. So over the years, beer and wine, um, because they were perceived as, as you know, less the evil that, you know, the roaring twenties created, um, got, uh, some, you know, progress and momentum. Wine was the first to get uh, interstate um, sales, direct sales to consumers in a lot of places, not everywhere still, but in a lot of places. Uh, craft beer can do that in, in most places as well now. And spirits is behind the curve. We just haven't had an advocacy group to do that up until, uh, you know, about 20 years ago. And then it's called the Distilled Spirits Advisory Council or Distilled, <laughs> the, 
Discus, D-I-S-C-U-S, Distilled Spirits Council of the United States. I'm on the craft advisory board for the Distilled Spirits Council. And this right now, direct to consumer is one of our hottest issues. And we're working with uh, legislators, the state legislators in our own states, as well as uh, in Washington to try to get access to consumers on an equal footing that wine has. There's no real reason for that, but it's a long haul. And it really is a Senator representative at a time to get the needle ticked over there. Uh, we're making good progress. We now have, I believe there's 18 states that have some type of legislation that allows for uh, manufacturers to sell to consumers um, as long as it's taxed and counted correctly and everybody's happy with it. There's also some really innovative things like in California, we have a direct to retail opportunity. It's not direct to consumer, but it starts with the consumer asking a retailer to get our products in. And this is a game changer for the small guys because um, you know, the big system works against us. They just, I mean, think about it this way. A distributor in California can't set an appointment with every single craft distributor to hear their story. I mean, there's 2000 of us, they wouldn't have time to do anything else. So they rely on the larger manufacturers to organize their portfolios so that they can digest it and get it to market you know, and also to market it uh, properly for them. And it, it's just a, you know, it's a numbers game. So uh, we're on the short end of that. So that direct to consumer is so important to us because we do have adores across the country. We have pockets of adores everywhere and we can't reach them because we can't go to Southern Wine and Spirits and ask them to put a statewide for you know, a pocket of love in Sausalito, for instance, right? If we could service that pocket of love in Sausalito, great. But that's not what the big distributors are set up to do. So um, it, it will be a game changer, but it's going to be a long haul, and it's going to be it's going to take people asking their representatives to help us out. Well, I think you know I'm very encouraged actually because if you look at, and I'm always loath anymore to say influencer marketing because that's become such a generic term for you know finding whether it's a micro and nano uh, all the way to celebrity influencer and trying to find the algorithm market around it. I'm really talking about kind of power to the people and their connections and their own networks, right? Um, that aren't stated celebrities like all of us on Zoom right now who have our favorite restaurants, our favorite clubs, our favorite country clubs. I mean, you know, name any one of them that we actually do have the power in this new uh, agreement, right? That's been made with the distributor to go to retail, to go to our restaurant and say, we want you to do this yeah. because, and we love this cocktail that we had with this amazing gin from Vermont Spirit. So this is, I think this is the game changer that truly um, is formidable and it changes the way I have to imagine that you reach out to people so that this huge body of advocates who wants to pull you through the channel is really powerful in a, a shorter time than one might imagine. Yeah, we have we have a great, um, it's, it's a new distribution channel for us. It's called LibDib, L-I-B-D-I-B. And uh, they're set up to be the intermediary, the distributor for little people like us. It stands for liberating distribution uh, and making a connection directly to retailers. So they're the distributor in the state. They sell to the retailer and the retailer gets it in because you go to a retailer and say, I would like to have number 14 bourbon because it's the best freaking Manhattan on the planet. And it's easier for you to make and everyone else is gonna love it too, but I want you to get it for me. So you send the request in through the retail, or to me actually, or you can send it to uh, directly to LibDib. Uh, there's an invitation for them to contact the retailer. Uh, you've asked for it. They've contacted the retailer and said, here's your order form. And all they have to do, literally, the retailer just has to push the button and they'll get the product shipped in for you, right? And so it's, it's, almost, it's almost direct to consumer. It doesn't go to your house, but it goes to your favorite location. It's as close as we're gonna get right now. And they're knocking out state at a time. Every state has to approve LibDib's system. California has just approved it and we are now available in California through LibDiv. So most of you um, can, can get our, our, you know, these things behind me as well as a couple others in, um, in California through LibDiv and through your local retail, your favorite local retailer. How many states are we talking about with LibDiv? Well, right now we're available in California, uh, Florida. Uh, we'll be in New York at the end of July. Uh, we will be in um, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin is a, a tertiary. We don't really have a circle of love there. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to build Wisconsin until we actually have people in Wisconsin who love us and, and want need us there. 
Um, and we're working on Texas. It's not, they're not available in Texas yet, but uh, we'll get there soon. So the big, big states are, are those, um, you know, New York, Florida, and California, California being first. Wonderful. So let me go to that beautiful bar behind you, Randy. And if you'll scoot over so that we can see this, um, just because I, safe to say, you have a couple of people here uh, who are very familiar with Vermont spirits and have enjoyed cocktails with, I believe, each one of those beautiful bottles. Um, but just take us quickly through them and um, what makes each special. So just real quick, this is our, our flagship and first product. This is Vermont Gold. It's 100% maple sap uh, fermented and distilled. Um, it is 80 proof. It's a full on vodka. It is not maple flavored vodka. It, um, you know, if I could describe the mouthfeel, um, this is kind of actually a shocking thing. Line up vodkas. A lot of people think vodkas are all the same. Line them up and you'll know the difference. Drew, I see a nod in your head. So you, you're, you must be a vodka guy, right? <laughs> Uh, this has a little bit of a little bit a little bit of sweetness. Some people get a caramely nose on it. Some people actually pick up a maple scent without even knowing that there's maple in there. Um, there's a little psychosomatic suggestion as well. You tell them, oh yeah, that's maple. Um, and then uh, kind of a, a lingering across the palate, kind of a lingering warmth all the way down. It doesn't have a lot of vodka has a rough spike at the back, and that's what people, a lot of people like in their vodka. This doesn't have that. So if you're if you're a martini uh, if you're a martini person and you like that back of the mouth thing, this may not be for you. If you're somebody who wants, perhaps, in my opinion, the smoothest vodka in the world, um, then this might be for you, right? So this is great. That's our original product. Um, it's not uh, it's not the cheapest way to make <laughs> vodka. It's one of the more expensive on the planet because maple, it's a hard process to get the sugars out. Um, after the vodka, we moved down, when we moved down to uh, mid-state Queechee, we started making some gins. And the one I have here represented uh, is actually our third iteration of those gins. We have an American style gin, which is a little bit lighter on the juniper uh, and a little bit more botanical integration. Uh, this is an evolution of that. Uh, it's called Copper's Barrel Gin. And uh, it's our Copper's American Gin. It goes into a used bourbon barrel. Uh, this particular bottle was seven years in those bourbon barrels and it drinks like a whiskey. It's, it's amazing uh, to say that, uh, but it is true. You could also drink it like a Reposado tequila. It's delicious. Um, has a little bit of that, that vegetal note that you get from the juniper, but it's not juniper forward in any way. Um, it's really, really a shocker. It's a, it's a great and very versatile thing. We're, we're doing old fashions with that uh, right now quite a bit. Um, number 14 bourbon is our, uh, it's our top, uh, top seller by a long shot. Bourbon, uh, you all probably know, is very hot right now. It's, it's on fire. It's growing uh, high double digits in a lot of places. And the craft uh, industry has really uh, latched on to, to bourbon. Um, this particular one is two barrels of bourbon blended together and then finished with a little bit of Vermont maple syrup. And it's, it's not flavored, it's not maple flavored, it's just to soften it up a little bit. And it gives it a, a, a that mouthfeel I was describing in the vodka, it kind of gives the bourbon that kind of a mouthfeel. So if you're used to a, a high rye or really punchy kind of a bourbon, um, this is the other end of that spectrum. It's more of a, an approachable, a first in bourbon. A lot of people who say they don't like bourbon, really love this. A lot of people who love bourbon like this. Um, and it, it really makes a, a terrific, um, well, really whatever you want to mix. And, and just for this group, not to tell anybody else, well, okay, everyone's going to know. Um, but it makes anything better. Red Bull, I, I, I'm not a big Red Bull fan, but Red Bull and number 15, number 14 is, is crazy good and simple. It's any, any bartender can make that. Um, and then we've got a variation that we made. This is a special release. It's only available at the distillery. Um, it's called 15 Hands. Uh, our number 14 references the state being the 14th state in the Union in 1791. Uh, Vermont was a republic during the Revolutionary War. It was out of the war, uh, with the exception of sending volunteers in, uh, Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys. But our 15 Hands is an homage to uh, the Morgan Horse, which was the SUV of the uh, 1800s, the 19th century. It was Everybody had one because they could do anything. And uh, 15 Hands is a really big Morgan Horse. So this is different than our uh, number 14 bourbon. Uh, this is uh, re-aged in our brandy barrels. It's a very high barley bourbon. So there's um, a lower corn, so it's less sweet. And the barley gives it a, a more, um, kind of a more of a scotch punch. And then the, the finish in our, um, in our brandy barrels really gave it more of a cognac. Like our brandy is, is very much a Calvados style, uh, authentic French. And if you've had a cognac, a really fine cognac, you know, you get that kind of aftertaste, that evaporative thing. Well, that, that character is in here and it comes through in our 15 hands as well. So 
we're really in the business of crafting great spirits using the things that are available to us right there. Our brandy was made from uh, Vermont, primarily Vermont. We also source from New York. Um, uh, fancy apples, so the, the French, uh, French fruit varieties that go into it. Um, our American gin is handpicked juniper from, uh, in fact, last fall, our distiller and my wife were out underneath the juniper bushes pulling down the berries to get the harvest for, our, uh, for this year's distillation. So everything has a connection uh, directly to our, our region, to, to New England and specifically to Vermont. Excellent, excellent. I want to go to um, chat. And um, we have, uh, oh, okay. So Drew, you know, currently drinking a cemetery gin and tonic with Eureka lemons and fresh garden thyme. That sounds incredible, absolutely incredible. So what would the corollary be with Vermont Spirits when of course we tell Drew that he simply has to use this gin and tonic? Oh. So Drew, tell me a little bit about cemetery. What do you like about, why do you choose cemetery? Coming off mute. Nope. Botanicals, got it. Okay, all right. All right, so it's yeah, not the juniper. Botanicals yeah, and the story. Not so story, sorry to interrupt. It's just like you said, it's the story. Yeah. Cemetery gin, it's a great story. You know, because the water was bad and all these people were dying. It was filling up the cemetery. So they started making gin, you know, and, and you, you drink the gin and not get sick and die. And the botanicals. So it's the story and the botanicals. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, gin has a long history. I think the tonic, um, it's, a, it's a seafaring um, origin. And it was uh, originally juniper, um, you know, created by the Dutch and uh, had its place in preserving botanicals coming back across the ocean. And that's what, uh, like the Nolet family at Kettle One, that's, they've been doing that for you know, generations, right? Uh, and creating this wonderful juniper in different ways. So the um, gin now, by definition, has to have juniper in it. And our traditional style gin, like a beef eater or a tangere, is, is very much juniper forward. It's, they, don't, they don't pretend to hide it. They just give you the juniper and then uh, let the mixers do the, the kind of um, infusion, if you will. Um, we take a different approach to our American style gin, which I don't have here, but that's the one Drew, I'd actually give you two to try. One is the American style gin. We dial back the juniper and then we have the other uh, traditional botanicals in it, coriander, cardamom, licorice root, uh, orange peel, uh, lemon zest, and licorice, and oh, I said licorice, and juniper, of course. And um, we let those botanicals do their own thing and let the juniper play a supporting role, more or less. I mean, juniper is always in gin, but it's more of a support and the botanicals really come through. The other one I'd suggest is one that our distiller um, came up with, uh, and it's his favorite right now, uh, is we call it sugar wood and it's even back it off a little bit more. So we've taken down the juniper a little bit. Uh, we uh, keep the orange peel in and uh, use uh, green tea in the distillation. So it gives it a, a different kind of a mouthfeel and sensation. And then like our number 14, he finishes it with a little bit of maple syrup only for softness. There's no maple flavor in it at all. I've never heard anybody say, yeah, well, I'll try some maple gin. Cause it's not, there's, <laughs> that's not the feedback we get, but the, um, and it's surprising how the green tea and the orange and the juniper uh, it just it gives it a, a more smoother ride, really, is what it does. So I'd start with the American if I were you, and then maybe give the, the sugar wood a run. So, um, Randy, I want to ask you about the, um, the whole dedication to supporting the local farmers, ranchers, producers in Vermont that are really the purveyors of all the ingredients used in the Vermont Spirits um, line. Yeah, so I mean, local is good business, right? It's just, it makes sense. If, if we have a healthy, uh, vibrant economy locally, then we can be healthy and vibrant in it. Um, and I'm, this was one of my missions when I, when I first joined the company was to be a good neighbor. And being a good neighbor is, first of all, getting to know your neighbors, people like Simon Pierce and the Woodstock Inn, uh, who um, are, are now not only good friends, uh, but advocates. And, um, you know, that's a start. Uh, the Woodstock Inn are doing some really great things, uh, working uh, with local farmers as well, sourcing their menus that way. Um, we have moved some of our uh, syrup uh, sourcing to a farm in w South Woodstock, which is about eight miles from our distillery. Uh, Richardson Family Farm, they've been in business for a very long time. Uh, they've got some beautiful trees up in, in, uh, in South Woodstock. And um, 
they're, they're turning out to be a great partner. I, I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but uh, our distiller just told me you got the best yields he's had out of any distillation so far uh, from the Richardson stuff. And so uh, I, I think it's, it's not, it's good karma too, right? So we're, <laughs> uh, we're going to, we're going to have a really nice uh, vodka run with that, but any way that we can do that and support, we will. Um, one thing we don't have plentiful that we do have to source other places. We don't have a lot of citrus trees up in Vermont. They don't grow well. So we source those botanicals uh, elsewhere from an organic, actually an organic source in, in uh, California. Um, we have uh, corn. I'd like to be getting all of our uh, corn uh, in Vermont. Unfortunately, we don't have the right um, suppliers at this point to get enough corn to make all of our spirits uh, with Vermont corn. So we expand that out and we'll look, um, you know, in a broader geography um, to, to source our, our other ingredients, but more local is just a better thing. And, and with the supply chains in the globe being just absolutely crushed uh, with COVID and it's gonna be a slow recovery, um, it's just more sensible to source things closer to where we are. It just makes you know, that much more sense to do it. Our, our timelines drop down, our reliability goes up. And um, you know, when, you, when you have somebody you know and can call up and, or stop by and, and talk to, it's, it's just a, it's a much better way to, for us to do things. Yeah. So as you look at um, growing the business, which of course coming out of COVID, part of that is some recovery of, you know, in the market of 2000 craft distillers. I mean, th there's, uh, there's some silver linings as you've pointed out, especially now with LibDib. Um, but what is, what kind of growth numbers are, are we talking about? It, you know, in terms of meaningful to, to consumers? What does that look like for one of 2000, right? Separating yourself with Vermont, with a maple wood, with all of the various characteristics you've shared with us tonight. What, what kind of is the hope of that in a business sense, longer term, five years from now? What does that look like? Wow. So our five-year plans, I think, are, are pretty ambitious, but not over the top. So we're, Vermont Spirits is the distillery, and these brands are some of the ones that, uh, that we create, right? Um, our, our first, and this is not a secret, but number 14 um, is our first and foremost. It's a, an exploding category. It's a, it's a highly differentiated product within it. It is truly authentic, and it, it, nobody else can tell our story. Um, it, you know, we've, we've got we, we have the rights to tell that story, right? So uh, we own those. What we haven't done is expanded beyond, it's, it's amazing to me, we've got this wonderful product, this wonderful brand that's locked up in all of this truth, and it hasn't expanded really beyond uh, Vermont and the state of New Hampshire. So that's our, our first and foremost, is to, to get that to be a regional brand, uh, service those pockets of love. Five years from now, I anticipate this will be a national brand with export. Um, and that'll be our kind of our first flag. Uh, that growth for us is, is tremendous and huge on the scale of a spirits introduction. My, my first line extension on Ciroc uh, was a half a million cases in, in one year. So for order of magnitude, that was the largest spirit launch in the history of spirits at that point in time. So we're, we're not, <laughs> our ambition is not to get a half a million cases. I would love to be there. That would be amazing and incredible. Uh, but we're only getting to about 40,000 cases over that time period. And it's, it's, a, it's an achievable, realistic goal with stepping stones to get there. Um, but for us, that's exponential growth. I mean, we're, we're, we're one of the small guys. A lot, I guess this is fortunate or maybe not so fortunate, a lot of the small craft distillers are, um, you know, they're family businesses, right? And they, they wanna be set up that way. They wanna to continue to be that way. That's not our ambition. We, we're, we don't wanna be a roadside attraction. We wanna be, you know, a national and international center for excellence which is what we have. And we just need to get that word out and just, <laughs> and, and be able to get it in the hands of the people who can help make it that thing. Right. Well, I, I have to tell you, you are on with um, a smaller group than had RSVP, but a very mighty group of people from Drew, whom you've um, been uh, talking to, who has his own craft business with the most extraordinary mustard I've ever tasted and sourdough focaccia that I am thinking there is a cocktail with this um, mustard and he's an amazing chef. You've got investors, you've got people in the wine business like Scott Liebman, uh, other investors and the common ground here is uh, people who really enjoy great spirits and a wonderful cocktail because who doesn't like to do that and 
in moderation, I'm supposed to say, and at the right time, and never around a car. But anyway, um, it, I think unless, it's, unless you're in the back of the car, that's okay, right? That's right. <laughs> exactly. With for sure, with somebody else uh, driving. Right. But I want to thank you, Randy, for sharing this with us because uh, our collective conscience uh, network and community of people are, as I have seen in the last year plus that we've been doing this. Um, love to um, stay in touch with the presenters and often get involved in a way from ambassador roles to um, advocates to investors and, and many other things. So um, I believe that will be true. I encourage everybody to stay in touch with uh, Randy. We, Sophie, if you'll put into chat uh, Randy's email so people can ask more about exactly what does it look like to walk into your favorite restaurant and say, I want you to bring in Vermont spirits because I want to have a Manhattan made with number 14. Um, I think that would be great. And is there anything in closing you want to share with us? Well, let me, if I can, if I can, I'm going to put into the post as well. If I can find it here, I had it up a second ago. Um, yeah, so I think this, um, you know, to your point, uh, Michaela, um, is the link to uh, LibDib and it's an outreach, right? So if you just direct your retailer there and we'll follow up as well in other ways. Um, and I, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. This is this is a, a, just a great, you know, I love talking about this industry. This is something I've been doing for, for quite a while. And uh, I think I have um, the um, unique opportunity to, to bring people in to some of the inside stuff that you might not otherwise know. And there's a lot more stories and I'd encourage you, you know, please do stop by. If I'm not there, uh, Harry will be. And if he's not there, then one of the, the hosts we have at front in the meeting house can certainly share um, more than, than you'll ever want to know, or less if that's what you prefer. Um, but, but I appreciate everyone's support. And Michaela, I particularly appreciate you for, for having me on tonight. Well, pleasure. And then for this group, everybody will be getting a special invitation to another Vermont Spirits event that we will be doing in August in a location that's secret at the moment. <laughs> but if you are interested and you have friends who are interested in joining <laughs> us for what I will call the cocktail workshop, um, please make sure that you send us their name if you'd like to make that introduction to us so that they um, get their own invitation. But Randy, thank you so very much. It was a pleasure, everybody. So nice to see you back on Collective Conscience. And I look forward to seeing you in July. In the meantime, toast with a Vermont spirit spirit. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks all. Thanks.